Okay. First of all, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me at this wonderful gathering of the 19th Century Research um, Committee of SABER. I wish I could have come to the earlier ones, um, but I actually welcomed my second child earlier this year. And so I've been uh, mostly chasing children uh, for the last seven months or so. Um, and I also wanted to say the a lot of what you're going to see today are images that are pulled from the archives at Phillips Academy Andover that have just been digitized within the last year, basically because I showed up at Phillips Academy Andover, started teaching this class on baseball and philosophy, and the archivist very kindly sent a bunch of students into the basement to digitize all these photographs. Um, so I would ask that you um, actually don't take pictures if that's okay, because most of these are, are I'm, I'm showing you for research purposes, but they haven't technically published them yet. So... Um, okay, today we're going to talk about the uh, history of baseball at Phillips Academy Andover, and the reason that we can talk about it is because Andover is one of these weird, old, elite preparatory schools that keeps all of its stuff because it is so fantastically impressed with its own history, right? Um, and so we actually just have a huge archive that we wouldn't have had elsewhere, um, which is why I have as much information as I do. Okay, uh, so I am going to work off a script, if that's okay. I work better off a script. I hope that's not too boring. Um, I will trade you some unpublished pictures for the uh, for the boredom of, of watching me read, if that's okay. Um, all right. So this paper is going to uh, present some new evidence for integrated baseball teams at the Elite Preparatory School Phillips Academy, which is in Andover, Massachusetts, about 30 minutes north of Boston uh, in the 19th century. And I'm going to focus on the lives and amateur athletic careers of three players. Chen Tung Liang Chung, who's a Chinese student graduating class of 1881, William Taylor Burwell Williams, who's a black student graduating class of 1893, and William Clarence Matthews, also a black student graduating class of 1901. Of the three, Matthews is the most well-known. I imagine most, some or most people here would know him, and he was definitely the most athletically talented. But all three better help us understand the complicated lives of players on integrated baseball teams in the latter part of the 19th century. With the help of the extraordinary documentation that we have here at Phillips Academy, I will show how Chen Tung Leong Chung's baseball exploits gave this Chinese student who would become the future Chinese ambassador to the United States, what seemed like his ticket to belonging in the baseball mad America of the 1880s, though he would always recall his time as that of an outsider. Um, I will talk about William Taylor Burwell Williams' experience on Andover teams against the backdrop of the deepening segregation of organized ball in the late 1880s and early 1890s. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about the promising but thwarted career of Matthews at the turn of the century and highlight ways in which his athletic achievements were often given an asterisk by his teachers and peers. Uh, the quotation in the title, in spite of his color, he's captain of the baseball nine this year, is a remark about his credentials from Andover's headmaster at the time. Um, I'm going to end by talking about the impact of this kind of evidence for integrated teams. And I really want to talk about how all three players were presented by their peers as exceptional cases whose accomplishment proved no categorical threat to the segregation of America's baseball diamonds and social institutions. Okay, so though baseball was almost certainly being played at colleges and preparatory schools in the early and mid 1800s, it became much more organized in the 1850s and 60s. These things I almost don't need to say to this group of people, but I say them anyway, um, especially in Massachusetts. The first intercollegiate baseball game of record was played in 1859 in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Um, and one history of athletics at Phillips Academy claims it fielded the first preparatory school baseball nine ever organized in the United States in 1866, although a more recent history says maybe 1864. Um, and by 1865, Andover's team was not just formed, but it would be famous. Um, Archie Bush, later regarded as one of the finest baseball players in the country at the time, played in Andover from 1865 to 1867, though he was expelled from school for cutting class to attend a baseball game in Boston. Happens to the best of us. Um, in the 1870s, baseball grew on campus and Andover set up some of the patterns that would be hallmarks of the program. Their starting nine began playing Harvard's freshman team in 1875, and they met their preparatory school nemesis, nemesis to this day, Phillips Exeter Academy, on the diamond for the first time in 1878. Um, and a lot of our evidence comes from student newspapers and yearbooks, and you'll see a lot of those today. Oops. Meanwhile, also in the late 1870s, Andover hosted some of the first Chinese students educated in the United States. The Hartford Chinese Educational Mission, initiated in 1872, 
brought 120 Chinese young men to New England preparatory schools and colleges to study. In 1875, a young man known as Liang Chung, though his peers called him Piyuk, arrived in the United States when he was only 12. He recalled that he was a big, lively fellow who spent the first years of his time in America doing nothing but playing baseball. Um, it's possible he played on the team you can see here, the Organized Chinese Educational Mission Baseball Team. Uh, they were based in Hartford. They were known as the Orientals, though they didn't want to be called that. They wanted to be called the Celestials. Um, they joined a semi-pro league. Most of their players seemed to be the college-age boys in their ranks. Um, but eventually, Liang Chung got in trouble for playing baseball too much, and they sent him to Phillips Academy. Um, and he matriculated in 1878. Um, even with his new stack of homework, he didn't stop playing baseball. His freshman year, he pitched for the freshman class baseball nine. His sophomore year, he was the pitcher for the second nine of the two school nines, which would have been the JV equivalent. Um, and his junior year, he made the school nine or the varsity team, and he was listed as the center fielder. Um, in the spring of his junior year, he distinguished himself on the diamond in an event that he would really happily repeat in newspaper articles and speeches for decades to come. Do I have a picture of Exeter? I do. Um, on June 8th, 1881, Andover took on Exeter. Uh, it was a match and a rivalry that would really get way more intense over the last 150 years. I will say I just saw these two teams play each other and the kids go crazy. So it's a, a longstanding rivalry. Um, Liang Chung, who is going to be, do I have the box score? Yes, I do. Um, who is listed as Piyuk in this box score here, went two for five and drove in three runs. Um, the campus account at the time doesn't remember him doing anything particularly remarkable, mostly just recounting that Phillips Andover took the lead from the start and maintained it throughout the game by means of the good batting of the nine generally, end quote. Nevertheless, Liang seems to have played well, all the more impressive as he had to endure the chanting of ethnic slurs, as Exeter fans hollered, quote, washy, washy, chinky, go back, Benji, end quote. Over time, as often happens when people rem reminisce on their teenage athletic exploits, Liang and his contemporaries came to remember the game as a great come from behind triumph. So in a speech he gave at the Phillips Academy alumni dinner in 1903, 20 years later or so, he described his return home from the game as follows. Even Rome could not have received Caesar with greater enthusiasm and pride when he returned from his famous campaigns in triumph. He came to credit this game with garnering him prestige and credibility in his future diplomatic career. And I'll talk about that in a second, especially as the public memory of the game became even more dramatic. In 1907, he recalled... President Roosevelt had told him that an Andover student he had met in one of his hunting trips in the West had informed him that he thought the new Chinese minister was the Chinese boy that played on the Andover nine in the 80s and won the championship game by a hit. When I assured the president that I was the same person, said Sir Leong, from that moment, the relations between President Roosevelt and myself became tenfold stronger and closer. Excellence in the American game and particular success in a matchup that would become the quintessential prep school rivalry paved the way for a stronger relationship between Liang and Roosevelt, and eventually between the United States and China. Never mind that Liang hardly won the 13-5 route by a hit. Roosevelt remembered it as such, and Liang's reputation as a clutch slugger did so much to smooth his very important path in U.S.-China relations. The tales of his baseball prowess would even grow in the press from this single incident, as in this 1903 piece from a New York Times special edition. The Phillips Academy boys at first took the idea of the China man's playing baseball as a joke and were disposed to guide him out of the box when he undertook to pitch. The young Mongolian had been playing in the field for a long time and had shown that he was worth the while at a long fly or a sharp play, but no one thought he knew a thing about pitching until one day the regular pitcher was away and he volunteered to take his place. There was a laugh all over the field when he went to the middle of the diamond. He'd hardly got down to work before they discovered that he'd got the knack of twisting the ball to suit himself and that he could curve the best man on the nine out of every time. As long as he stayed at Andover, he had the honor of pitching in the first nine of the school. As with President Roosevelt's recollection of a crucial clutch hit, this accounting is not strictly the case. Um, according to the campus newspapers, he didn't make the school nine until his junior year, and when he did, he was, not the, he was listed as the center fielder, not the pitcher. But... The story of him surprising everybody with his curve is the memory that made the papers. He wasn't just a baseball player, but he was a star. That's how people remembered him. Um, his success on the diamond was much remembered or maybe embellished, and it, but it was also framed as a kind of novelty. In the article that we just saw here, it's assumed that a China man's playing baseball is a joke. But the story goes, Leong distinguished himself so thoroughly as a baseball player that his detractors were silenced. 
The assumption is that he would know little about baseball, which is a reasonable assumption for an international student in the 19th century, but also that he wouldn't be good at it. And as can be noted, many of our sources reproduce a tension between his Chinese identity and his ability to distinguish himself in this distinctively American pastime, often by emphasizing that he was the exceptional candidate over to overcome, able to overcome his background. One way that Liang made visible the tension between Chinese identity and the great American pastime was in remarking on multiple occasions how traditional Chinese dress is incompatible with baseball play, as in a 1905 account of an annual reunion chronicled by the Washington Post. Could you give us now one of those down shoots you used to hand out when we were up against Yale or Harvard, asked one of the alumni well acquainted with the minister. Not in these clothes, whispered the minister, glancing at his silken robes. And in a 1906 interview with the Post, he said, if we Chinese men wanted to play, our clothes would be too much in the way. Do you think that I could make home base in this costume? Pointed to his light skirts with smiling derision, end quote. Liang's comments were not idle reflections, as the issue of dress may have been one of the major flashpoints for Chinese boys taking part in the Chinese educational mission, and it seems to have been the reason that the missions were disbanded. The boys arrived wearing, as was traditional, the Chang Pao, which is an ankle-length silk gown, and hairs braided into long queues or braids but many quickly disavowed them in the face of wicked teasing. By the late 1870s and 1880s, the boys had completely abandoned them in favor of Western dress and, when applicable, baseball uniforms. In the picture of the Harvard Orientals here, the viewer sees nine Chinese students looking a lot more like major leaguers than mandarins. And that's a quote from Reeves taking the game. With this cultural dynamic in mind, we should look again at the picture of Liang from Andover's archives. What's most notable against the backdrop of concerns over dress and assimilation is the reality that he doesn't look that different from his teammates. He's wearing the same outfit. He's posed the same way. He has his hair cut the same length. He's not wearing a long robe. His hair isn't braided. He's costumed the same as every other boy. We, should, we can't take this for granted, and we should attribute great agency to his choice to be so thoroughly integrated into cult the cultural mores around him. He made a deliberate choice to look just the same as his team. In 1881, the Chinese educational mission was disbanded and the boys were sent home. Liang never got to finish his senior year at Andover. He would go on, however, to have a long and fruitful diplomatic career, the zenith of which was his appointment as the Chinese ambassador to the United States from 1902 to 1907. As ambassador, he helped negotiate the United States payment of the Boxer Indemnity and used some of that money to found Tsinghua University. Unsurprisingly, with him as the benefactor, Tsinghua University ended up with a baseball team, the first in China. It was as ambassador that Leon gave many of the interviews cited above, reminding the reader of his illustrious path as a baseball player, but also tacitly affirming that his baseball accolades were somehow surprising in, and or in tension with his Chinese identity. Chen Tung Leong Chung was a baseball player, but one who never forgot the ways in which his integration onto the team carried certain caveats. In the end, his baseball interest was so exceptional that it was newsworthy. The materials cited above showcase article after article dedicated to reporting the mere fact that he once played or even liked baseball. Leong's place on Andover School 9 did not mark a new era of international play at Andover, but instead it was remembered as a kind of curio. And his time playing baseball reinforced the historical boundaries of American identity and belonging, and his own position outside of them, even though he remembered the time very fondly. Oh, that's not it. Next up, we have William Taylor Burwell Williams, class of 1893. Uh, baseball in the latter part of the 19th century was not just a sport for professionals, nor was it even reserved for really talented athletes. As American historian Ronald Story puts it, quote, for every club or professional player we can identify from the late 1860s to the early 1800s, there were almost certainly 100 non-professional players on organized teams and 1,000 on unorganized ad hoc ones, end quote. Thanks to the recent efforts of Andover's archives to organize and digitize their photographic collections, we can now add prominent black intellectual and educator William Taylor Burwell Williams to that metaphorical thousand playing on these loosely organized teams. But William's story has its own meaning against the backdrop of the 1880s and 1890s, when the integration of black players onto white rosters, pursued in isolated pockets across organized baseball, really came to a crashing halt. William's appearance on Andover's mostly white teams in the early 1890s marks the swan song of a kind of informal integration that would not characterize the next chapter of American baseball history. Williams belonged to, is that the right slide? Yeah. Williams belonged to what baseball historian Jerry Malloy calls a tragic generation of African-Americans reaching adulthood at a time in the mid 1880s 
when the brutal protocols of racial discrimination that would soon follow seemed by no means inevitable, end quote. He was born on a farm in near Stonebridge, Virginia, to formerly enslaved farm workers. And in 1934 profile, which might have even been written by W.E.B. Du Bois in the NAACP's official magazine, The Crisis, stated that he was born in an area where friendly relations between white and colored people of that section continue unbroken, end quote. A 1922 profile would even reflect that William's lengthy name was a tribute to a local white family, end quote, witnesses to the friendly tie between the cabin home and one of those families, end quote. Williams, interviewed for both pieces, clearly remembered his childhood as one in which friendliness was possible across racial lines during the Reconstruction period after the Civil War. In keeping with Williams' memories of a congenial hometown in post-war Virginia, it was not a foregone conclusion that baseball would be a segregated game after the war. There were, of course, some very early signals of prejudice. In 1867, the National Association of ba Baseball Players voted to bar from their ranks, quote, any club who have applied who are composed of persons of color or any portion of them, end quote. But this one ruling wouldn't mean the end of black and white players sharing the diamond, though it showed a trend towards all black teams and eventually all black leagues. For an early close to Andover example, in 1870, for instance, two, black, two teams, one black team from Boston and one white team from Elizabeth, New Jersey, played a game, the outcome of which decided who would have the right to name themselves the Resolutes, and the black team won. Um, James Brunson's recent treatment of black baseball teams in Massachusetts in the 19th century lists one team in act active as early as the 1860s and three in the 1870s, but you can see here an explosion to 12 in the 1880s and a slightly different 12 in the 1890s. These 16 teams introduced by Brunson III, to my best knowledge, comprise all black rosters, though we do have records indicating that 13 of the 16 played some games against white teams, but the obvious trend is towards segregated baseball teams. Beginning in 1878, some black players managed to eke out careers in organized baseball, by which we mean the majority white leagues that are the ancestors of the modern major and minor leagues. Um, a 1977 report published in the Society of American Baseball Research's Baseball Research Journal counted 55 black players who played in the minor leagues between 1883 and 1898, but noted that over half of that representation came from all black teams playing against all white teams. Massachusetts made a few prominent contributions to this count. For instance, the first black man to play on an integrated team in an organized ball setting seems to have been Bud Fowler, who pitched for the Live Oaks of Lynn, Massachusetts against the Boston Red Stockings in 1878. Another luminary with local roots was Frank Grant, a Pittsfield, Massachusetts native who started out in 1884 playing on semi-pro teams in Pittsfield and then moved up to playing professionally with the Buffalo Bisons of the International League from 1886 to 1888. This chart organizes the data from the 1977 report to give us a sense of the extent and limits of integrated ball at the close of the 19th century. Though the chart may not advertise it at first glance, something significant shifted in 1887. As the 1907 history penned by Saul White, black player from this generation who would be the most important chronicler of 19th century black baseball reflects, quote, 1887 was a banner year for colored talent in the white leagues. But this year marked the beginning of the elimination of colored players from white clubs. All the leagues during the winter of 1887 and 1888 drew the color line or had a clause inserted in their constitutions limiting the number of colored players to be employed by each club. Historians are divided on why matters boiled over in 1887. Saul White blamed Cap Anson, though it's hard to say. But from that point on, the trend was towards teams made up of all black players with an ever decreasing number of games played against white opponents. 1887 also saw the founding of the National Colored Baseball League, a league which comprised eight all-black teams, though it had to fold due to financial troubles after only a month. Organized baseball was headed towards a segregated future. Williams' educational career followed a similar path, with significant early achievements in integrated settings, but with an ever-present undercurrent directing his future contributions towards all-black institutions. He began his career at Hampton Institute as a student, then began at Andover in 1889 and finished at Harvard. Um, although he was quite old for a student, he was 23 in his freshman year at Andover and 27 in his freshman year at Harvard. But he was an influential intellectual voice on campus. He was president of the Society of Inquiry, the biggest Christian group on campus, vice president of the Republican Club. He was um, on the executive committee of the Debate Society, managing editor of the campus newspaper. And in 1893, a humorous piece written by the students about their peers, so they were making fun of everyone, it's not just him, um, 
talked about Williams as such. As usual, Williams is never left out, and so I find his card. This man is a hard worker, managing editor of the Philippian, first Draper Prize, second means, and so on. No doubt he has a great career if it could only be found. However, this much has been ascertained. For eight years previous to his coming to Andover, he worked on a perpetual motion machine and seems to have perfected the instrument in his own tongue. Williams was, then, one of the more motivated and accomplished students on campus. He was a hard worker, a mile-a-minute talker, and we might expect his teachers to reflect him as such. But his race would define how he was presented to others. In letters sent to Harvard in support of his receiving a scholarship, his former teacher, D.J. Comstock, called Williams, quote, the best specimen of the colored race that I've ever met in preparatory work, end quote. Andover's principal, Cecil P. Bancroft, in a compliment of dubious value, called him, quote, a fine specimen of the cunning colored man, end quote. And both recommenders repeated their estimation that Williams was hoping to stay within his own racial community. So Comstock said, quote, he plans to give his life work to the education of his race, end quote. This focus of his life work on the education of his race, and again, that's a quote from Comstock, would ultimately be the case as he devoted his life to Black educational institutions. He received a doctorate from Morehouse College, was president of the National Association of Teachers and Colored Schools, dean of the college at Tuskegee Institute, and he would get the NAACP's Spring Garden Medal in 1934, placing him in the August company of other Spring Garden recipients like Hank Aaron, Langston Hughes, and W.E.B. Du Bois. He was a driven and uniquely accomplished individual, but his life's work would take place in mostly segregated settings. He appears in photographs of two Andover baseball teams, one with the board of the Philippian, the student newspaper, and one with the faculty baseball team. Do I have that one? It's not here. Oh, well. Um, though we have no further documentation contextualizing either one, it would be a very mature and well thought of student who would be invited to join the faculty team, and his advanced age probably helped. He wasn't one of the stronger athletes on campus. He's not listed as part of the school nine or anything. Um, but through these photographs, we do have proof that he did integrate Andover's baseball diamonds when he was a student in 1892 and 1893. And to that end, his story provides a moving illustration of two large political trends baseball's explosion in popularity, especially on an informal level but also the closing window of integration for America's baseball diamonds and social institutions. Now to William Clarence Matthews, the only one of the three young men featured here that a baseball fan might be expected to know, especially the fans here today. Um, and this limited fame comes because Matthews was one of the last black players to garner major league interest. And his denial of a spot on a roster basically marked the onset of the strictest chapter of segregation of American baseball. He was also the most talented athlete of the three surveyed here. He was a multi-sport star at Andover. He would go on to be the same at Harvard. Um, and he clearly found something really valuable on a baseball diamond. A success on the field allowed him a kind of community that he might not have otherwise experienced. But like William Taylor Burwell Williams, the color of his skin meant that everything he accomplished at Andover was represented by his contemporaries with an asterisk. And there were limits placed on his future achievements. He's known for being denied to play for being denied the shot to play baseball at the highest level. But the seeds of that story are to be found in his mixed first experiences in an integrated setting in his Andover days. Matthews was born in Selma, Alabama in 1877. He attended the Tuskegee Institute from 1893 to 1897, where he seems to have been player coach of the football team at some point, as well as captain of the baseball team. In 1898, with the personal support of Booker T. Washington, he went north to enroll at Phillips Academy. And like Williams, on account of his previous schooling at a Black institution, Matthews was older than the average student. He was matriculating when he was 20 years old. He was one of only two Southern students, and he was the only Black student in his class. And he distinguished himself in, on Andover's campus as a multi-sport star in baseball, football, and track. In the world of baseball, Matthews was playing on a prominent, though amateur, integrated team at a time when vanishingly few were in the public eye. When Matthews was playing at Andover from 1898 to 1901, the only black player in integrated organized baseball, to my knowledge, was Burt Jones, a lefty pitcher playing for Atchison in the Kansas State League, which is not exactly a prominent or well-known example. By the close of the 19th century, black players were relegated to playing on all black teams, and it would be several decades before the golden age of the Negro Leagues gave these players a brighter stage. A survey of black players on white college baseball teams will demonstrate that cases like Matthews were few and far between. Between 1879 and 1909, covering all American colleges, we have evidence for just 15 black players on integrated college teams, 
and I'm sorry for the formatting here. It's it's such a long chart that I had to split it across two slides. And so I feel like it's very hard to navigate. Um, and I, I'd be happy to talk about where I got all this information from if that's, if, if that's of interest to people. Um, preparatory school records are less complete, though what is extant preserves minimal evidence of black students playing on white teams. Um, some preparatory schools like Lawrenceville and Nobles didn't ad did not admit black students until the 1960s, and so they couldn't have fielded integrated teams. Um, Arthur Ashe's History of Black Athletics mentions that Booker T. Washington's son, Booker T. Washington Jr., attended Governor Dummer's Academy, which is here in Massachusetts, and played catcher. So that would have been around the 20th century. Um, and William Taylor Burwell Williams belongs on the list, although he didn't play on a varsity team. And Matthews is obviously well known an example. Um, against this very limited backdrop of Black players on college and preparatory school teams, the fact that Matthews integrated Andover's team is historically significant. It was not an accomplishment undertaken by very many or in very many places. But thanks to, his ar thanks to Andover's archives, we can actually stay, say still more about his experiences on the team. Matthew's yearbook indicates that his significant athletic talents may have contributed to a greater experience of belonging as he was celebrated on campus for his athletic achievements. As a senior, he got 84 votes from his peers for best athlete. Second place, got four votes. Uh, he also won most versatile. He came in third for most popular. Um, he was involved around campus, associate editor of the student newspaper, vice president of the Republican Club, and he was elected to give one of seven class toasts at the senior dinner. His toast, of course, was on athletics. Um, but campus was not always so welcoming. For example, his biographer, Carl Lindholm, who, by the way, is who I got a ton of this information about William Clarence Matthews on, who's been working on this biography for a really long time, and it's wonderful work. He was kind enough to share it with me. So all of the a lot all, all of the work that's being done on William Clarence Matthews by him has just been magnificent. Um, but he has this story which shows that it might've been difficult for him to find a home on campus, even with his teammates. In 1901, the night before the Andover Exeter game, and remember this is the big matchup that Leong Chung was so excited about. Um, this was his senior year, a minstrel show came to campus. In recognition of their coming importance in the big game tomorrow, nine of the 12 members of the baseball team were selected as the special students who would appear on stage in blackface, filling out the semicircle which the master of ceremonies would engage. Many of these students would perform very exaggerated caricatures during the show. The starting first baseman, whose name was Ralph Waldo Emerson Hasenwinkel, which is a great name, seems to have played a very big role. Um, and the show was so popular, it couldn't even be held on campus. They had to hold it in the town hall. We don't know whether Matthews was there. It doesn't say. Um, but wh whether present or not, it seems hard to imagine any young man being comfortable with having his race be mocked by his peers for hours on end. Even in such a social milieu, Matthews achieved something unparalleled by any other player listed in the table before. He was elected captain his senior year, and his captaincy even made the papers as far as Chicago. The Chicago Tribune reported, Colored Man Captures Andover, unusual honor conferred upon W.C. Matthews of Montgomery, Alabama, and noted the choices regarded with great favor. But such news also got negative responses from Andover alums. A 1901 letter from Edward G. Burgess, class of 1895 at Andover, claims he's writing on behalf of several old Andover men. Burgess urged the head of school to overturn the boys' election. Quote, he, forgives the boy their bad, he forgave the boys their bad judgment in the excitement of the moment, but said, quote, the best players rarely make good captains, end quote. The writer objected to the fact that, quote, a Negro is made captain of a nine of white men, end quote, and warns that Andover's good name is at stake. For all they take very different positions, both the Chicago Tribune article and the letter from Burgess couple Matthew's race with his captaincy. Indeed, later in the very same month of April 1901, Principal Bancroft would write to Harvard in support of Matthew's getting a scholarship and say, quote, he is a young man of good character, of good manners, and he has a high athletic record, and in spite of his color, is captain of the baseball team, end quote. And just like the qualified recommendations that we've seen that were provided to Williams, Matthew's teachers and mentors at Andover would send him on to Harvard, but with very caveated endorsements. Charles Forbes, his former Latin teacher, would recommend him as one who, quote, represents the best there is in a Negro. He is a sensible fellow of good mental makeup. He has a rare sense of the necessity to do more than mediocre work, and he lays no claim to special indulgence, end quote. Alfred Stearns, who was the baseball coach and would become the headmaster of Phillips Academy, said, quote, 
Matthews is one of the very few colored fellows in whom I've placed a great deal of confidence. I have always taken an unusual interest in him and have found him unusually reliable and straightforward, something rather rare in his race, end quote. In both of these letters, Forbes and Stearns reveal very low expectations for, quote, a Negro and, quote, colored fellows, respectively, while identifying Matthews as the exception to the rule. In his freshman year, Matthews would walk on to Harvard's baseball team. He would letter all four years and would be the star shortstop for a team coached by such luminaries as Cy Young and Wee Willie Keeler. Upon graduating in 1905, he played professional ball for a Northern League, which is an independent league team in Burlington, Vermont. And in July of 1905, the Boston Traveler repeated a rumor that Matthews might be signed by the Major League Boston Nationals, but the signing never came to pass. Matthews gave several interviews at the time, remarking, quote, I think it is an outrage that colored men are discriminated against in the big leagues. What a shame it is that black men are barred forever from participating in the national game. I should think that Americans would rise up and revolt against such a condition. Many Negroes are brilliant players and should not be shut out because their skin is black. As a Harvard man, I shall devote my life to bettering the condition of the black man, and especially to secure his admittance into organized baseball. Sadly, this incident would mark the end of his baseball career, but as promised, he did devote his life to, quote, bettering the condition of the black man, end quote, as he studied for and passed the bar in 1908. While in law school, he coached high school baseball in the Boston area at Boston Latin, Dorchester High, and Noble and Greenough. And from 1920 to 1923, he served as chief legal counsel for Marcus Garvey's United Negro Improvement Association. He would remain active in the Republican Party, and when Coolidge became president in 1904, he was assistant attorney general in the new administration. But tragically, he died of a perforated ulcer just four years later. Compared to the careers of Leong and Williams, both of whom took up leadership roles specifically tied to their racial identities, like the ambassador from China or an educator at Black institutions, it's remarkable that so much of his professional life took place in integrated spaces. But even his ability to succeed in these spaces was interpreted as a skill at odds with his race. The Dean of Harvard College, B.S. Herbert, used a remark made by his teammate. He called him, quote, the whitest man he knew, end quote, to try and drum up business for Matthews when he was starting out as a lawyer. And yet, even when so qualified by his white contemporaries, it was possible for him to become a lawyer, but not a ball player. Matthew's story has been seen as one of hope, even by his contemporaries. Saul White's History of Colored Baseball mentioned the rumor of Matthew's signing <clears throat> as doomed, but still providing the grounds for hoping that someday the bar will drop and some good man will be chosen from out of the colored profession that will be a credit to all and pave the way for others to follow, end quote. In 1965, the Boston Globe columnist Harold Kaza called Matthew's, quote, the Jackie Robinson of his age, end quote likening the ways Matthew had to fight against encroaching segregation with the groundbreaking entry of Robinson into the big leagues in 1947. <clears throat> in this way, Matthews is situated as someone who was thwarted by the prejudice of his time, but whose story echoes what would one day come to pass. The problem with this framing is that it uses the future to solve for the past. Matthew's story becomes a waypoint on an inevitable journey towards full integration, but this is not the way that his belonging on the team was conceptualized at the time. Indeed, Alfred Stearns, Matthew's baseball coach at Andover, who would become head of school, expressed regret that Matthew's career led him to work in integrated spaces in the North. <clears throat> in a 1907 letter to Matthews himself, Stearns said, I'm frank to say, however, and I say it only as a sincere friend and well-wisher, that one of the biggest disappointments I've had since I took hold here in Andover arises from your seeming failure to work out the plan you originally had of returning to work among your people in the South. I believed then, as I do now, that you have an opportunity there such as you could never hope to have anywhere else, and such as is given to few men. I hope it does not mean a lowering of ideals, for I hate to have my old faith in you and your future completely shattered. <clears throat> One second. Stern's language reflects the extreme frustration of his rigid expectations for Matthews. The expectations are set categorically in keeping with his race, rather than individually in keeping with his talents. And experiences like this meant that Stearns would later try and deepen Andover's exclusion of black students as he later reflected that he, he regretted what he'd done to support colored students in the past. As he says, in my earlier years as head of school, I fought vigorously for the colored boys in our midst and for those who sought to enter. As years passed, it seemed to me that th these boys were being harmed more than helped. These fellows were pretty sure to have their heads turned to be cut off more or less 
from the natural work among their own people, which was their lot and privilege, end quote. Stern's regrets that he fought to create an integrated campus, relying on the segregationist ten and above, that these young men should stick to, quote, the natural work among their own people, which was their lot and privilege, end quote. And it's this exclusionary chapter of American history and Andover history that comes next, not the triumphant and courageous breaking of boundaries that we associate with Robinson's bravery in 1947. So it's likely that Andover baseball was something that brought joy, purpose, and belonging to all these students' young lives. But it's also difficult to escape the reality that Andover had ways of identifying all of these three young men as outsiders. And so, rather than being signals of progress, I think these ballplayers help us realize something different, something that's really best remembered with our remembered ache of teenage angst and against the backdrop of a high school. Integrated baseball in the 19th century, insofar as we could find evidence it existed, probably felt kind of uncomfortable and awkward at times. To that end, we should remember the image of Matthews, who was captain and star of the Andover starting nine, probably sitting at home in his dormitory in the summer of 1901 before the biggest game of his high school career, while most of his teammates paraded across the stage at a minstrel show. His experience was unique, of course, but thanks to Andover's rich documentation of the lives of its students and alumni and the prominence in public life that many of them had later, we do have this glimpse into the kinds of experiences that greeted non-white ballplayers in the 19th century. There must have been parallels in the lives of all these 19th century ballplayers, not just these three young men here today, but, but of the people who we talked about before, your Bud Fowlers and your Frank Grants. All of these players in the formative years in which they learned to play ball experienced a curious mix of in inclusion and exclusion, which was made possible by America's pastime. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, that was, that, uh, for a topic that's just, you know, you, you think kind of local, it sp spreads out, and takes in a lot of territory uh, where, you, where you get at. Uh, if you would be so kind to take your uh, uh, slides down and we'll get to see everybody again. Uh, just go ahead and close. There you go. Now, if you want to see the whole thing just go up to that view on the upper right and hit gallery and you'll see everybody up there again there's several several questions came came in uh woody eckert asked uh did liang attempt to introduce the game back home in china ah yes so he did he founded this uh this baseball team at Tsinghua university um but i think basically what happened to him was he he went back to China very briefly, but then he he was a diplomat. So he got sent abroad for most of his career. And he also died kind of young. Um, so I, most of what I most of what we can figure out about him comes from um, his time living in America. And he was also a diplomat in Germany. But yes, he did found the first baseball team. Yeah, you said I, I believe you said he, he, he came to America when he was 11. Yes. So they sent these boys when they were very, very young. It was sort so of a is, plan. Do we have any information about him playing, picking up the game as, as an adolescent and then therefore being at least somewhat familiar with the game when he got to Andover? Or was that something new to him? Uh, so this is a guess. I'm now speculating. It seems like because this team in, in Hartford, where they were all hanging out, waiting to basically be placed in schools, it seems like he played with them. And then there's another story that I cut for time, which is when they went, when they got sent back home in 1883 or whatever it was, um, they they flew, they, they took a train across the country to Oakland, and then they were going to take a, a steamer from Oakland to China. And when they were in Oakland, apparently they were challenged by, you know, a local, a local gang of kids who thought that it would be fun to watch the Chinese boys, you know, flounder on the field and instead they won. And of course the, the, you know, the Chinese boys went home and they all told this story for the next 45 years to anyone who would listen. So. Uh, uh, well, Jack Bales makes it, uh, uh, says this is just an observation, not a question. Yeah, you know, I've researched the life of Lewis Meacham, the uh, Chicago Tribune sports reporter and editor who helped William Hulbert found the uh, National League in 1876. Oh. Meacham attended Phillips Academy in 1860. I don't know if it was Andover or Exeter. Uh, uh, and though I, I could not find uh, that he played baseball, I did discover that he was active on campus as a member of the 
Philomathian Society Debate Club and was the executive committee of the Mirror Literary Magazine. That may tell you which school he was at. Yeah, it was Andover. It was yeah. oh, okay, awesome. yeah. okay, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, I, I had no idea. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was uh, as uh, Jack presented earlier this year on uh -huh. on Meacham, and oh, he was really? yeah. he was one of the uh, 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 what do you call him? The mouthpiece of Hulbert. Or mouthpiece, something? exactly right. Uh, uh, yeah. Of mm -hmm. of that, where he was the uh, uh, ally of Hulbert in. Uh, supporting his effort to uh, uh, promote Chicago and form this new league. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Shannon uh, Gordon notes that these photos are just wonderful. Uh, will they be published or be accessible to the public? Um. So, as we we just found them maybe four months ago. Um. So they our our hope is to put them up on Phillips Academy Andover's website. And when that happens, there will be a little baseball thing, and I would be happy to share them with um the 19th century group. The thing that I think is great, and I'm sure that as you know, people who are interested in the 19th century, you all have your own photographic archives that you think are wonderful. The thing that's so great about these is just that there's so many of them, and they're very intimate, and they're very sort of like close to the field, and um. Yeah, it's just we we only have them because because the school kept them in boxes for 150 years because they they love the long history. So and the resolution is very 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 crisp on on most of those. Uh, uh, Woody Eckert also made a comment that uh, noting that did, didn't Paul Robeson play baseball at Rutgers around the middle teens, 1915 yeah. or so. So he would have been another one to add to your list if you, if you extended the time a little. Yep. So yeah. I, I had to cut it off basically at, at a certain point. But yes, the Paul Robeson one is the greatest Easter egg. Isn't that fun? <laughs> and and they've been, you know, uh, uh, Turner Classic Movies have been running a bunch of his movies. Now, of course, they, they run them at, at two in the morning, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, and there's any number of comments here of a splendid, excellent presentation. And thanks. Uh, Pam, uh, 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 Baker uh, notes that uh, this is just so interesting and so important to share. I think it does open up a new realm of how more information of what some of the players went through in school and out of school. Uh, but they did, they were all successful individuals in their, their further life. Yeah. They, and again, part of that is because Phillips Academy has sent, sent them all to Harvard and, you know, everyone did their handshake deal seat, right? That's part of the, the allure. But one of the things I thought that was really great, especially reading up, learning about these players in the context of having been interested in baseball history for a long time, is we really do kind of get a sense of a, a little bit more of their lives because they were so prominent later, right? A lot of sort of 19th century ball players, they were on a team and then, you know, Maybe they just went back home and worked in a hardware store and the Chicago Tribune didn't call them and ask them for interviews. Um, or, you know, it's it's hard to know kind of what happened before their name pops up on a roster. And so it, I thought it was very fun to be able to track some of these guys ostensibly through more of their lives and kind of see how baseball was part of a richer thing that they got up to. Uh, Dixie, you have a, a question or a comment? Yes, Elena, what kind of students are drawn to your courses at Phillips Andover? So I I created the class because we have a very strong um, baseball program here. And I uh, I thought maybe they wouldn't want to take a philosophy class unless I put baseball in the title. And I was a big baseball <laughs> fan, so I thought that I would. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that the, the number one um, person taking uh, baseball philosophy is a student recruit. So prep schools will often operate a lot like colleges. Um, in the sense that uh, they will often pick pick, pe pick people to come play on their teams, right? Um, in a way that more people are more familiar with in like a college setting, right? You, oh, I'm going to go play, you know, baseball at, at Oregon or whatever. Um, and so we have a lot of kids who would come here for the explicit purpose of playing baseball. And it is my goal to capture them and secretly um, teach them philosophy along the way. Somehow the two are you'll find a way to mix them together in the bowl. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think that's most of the uh, comments and uh, questions. Elena, thank you so much. And one more question, sorry. And my missus, well, whoever it is, go ahead. 
Hi, Carl Lindholm. Hey, Elena, let's get together. Uh, <laughs> Elena described me as Matthew's biographer. I'm Matthew's failed biographer. No. But I worked for a long time on Matthew's. And he went on to Harvard. Most Andover students went to Yale. Yes. I was not interested in having a black fellow. Harvard had some black fellows. Mm -hmm. And I think it's safe to say that Matthews in 1901 to 1905 was the best college baseball player in the country. Mm -hmm. And it was at a time when great college baseball players walked off their diamonds in college on to major league rosters, Christy Matheson at Bucknell, for example, Eddie Collins at Columbia. So Matthews is a kind of a, is a pretty fascinating figure. I, Elena, you've done a wonderful job. And, and, and what's, what's fun for me in research, Matthews now is the, is the name on the Ivy League baseball trophy. Mm. And so he has, and, and he is acknowledged in Cooperstown, there'll be a, a little uh, a citation of him. So he's, He's become somewhat known, um, and I think we, when we look at Matthews in that period, his experience at, at Andover, when you look at it deeply, did you ever know Ruth Quattlebaum? Mm -hmm. it, oh, wonderful. She, he was apparently, correct me if you, if you have a different view, entirely accepted. Mm -hmm. which is really unusual. You cited the the, the uh, class uh, superlatives or something. That mm. He was the most versatile. He was the best. There's not a single negative. There's nothing even condescending. That's not true at Harvard uh, in a larger sphere, but he really, so I won't go on and on. He's a, he's a fascinating figure. And uh, I think his experience, the one image that stays with me uh, is the fact that the majority of his classmates were in this minstrel show. And there's a lot of, inst a, and which was the big event the night before the climactic uh, Andover Exeter baseball game. It was held in the town hall and everybody went. And I just imagine Matthews there watching his teammates in this. Uh, and this, you know, we all know about minstrel shows and it's overt racist content. And uh, he's just a, he's a fascinating figure. And I, I feel in the work that I've done, I, I got articles out of it and some presentations at Sabre meetings. And um, it's just, a, it's wonderful that he went to Andover and then he went to Harvard because those are school, two schools that don't throw anything away. Mm -hmm. It's all there in their yearbooks and their in their newspapers and their uh and so forth so it's true at both places he he's a really fascinating fellow and that's a i appreciate your presentation it's really well done well as i say i got a lot of my stuff on matthew straight from carl Lindholm. so it's so fun that you're here today hi carl i'm so glad <laughs> well well lena thank you so much for the uh, the presentation and and the work uh discovering these oh. folks and it's not the sort of thing that 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 there's a footnote in some major book that you, you, know, you have to come across these things and get interested and find some little squib in a newspaper. You say, oh, let's go look that up. Very nice. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you. And uh, we hope you'll uh, uh, join us again. Thank you very uh, much for having me. This was really fun. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Peter, if you'd like to, to close. Well, I'll look at we are very, very uh, excited to have you, and you really proved to be the real deal. <laughs> I mean, there was so much anticipated here, and I think it all became, it all came to fruition. Uh, you know, regarding 19th century baseball, uh, I've been involved with this committee, I guess, since I joined Sabre, and black baseball is a little bit like an onion. And you know, we peeled that first layer of the onion, and it was the professional players. It was only Fleetwood Walker, and then along came, you know, his brother Wendy, and then we got a little glimpse of uh, uh, William White playing at Brown and uh, playing uh, for the Providence Grays that one game. 
But then the second layer was like the people that were the minor leaguers that were playing professional baseball, but in the minor league. You've now gone down another layer of this onion, <laughs> this 19th century baseball onion, and have revealed so much of what's happening, what was happening at the collegial or academic levels. And it, it just, it's just an amazement to me to, uh, to kind of discover all of this. And uh, thank you again for an excellent presentation. It was really a pleasure to, uh, you know, our pleasure to enjoy it. Uh, okay, our next presentation, our last Bob season four, Bob season four. <laughs> our last presentation of season four is next month on May the 14th when Vincent Charamella, I can pronounce that name, <laughs> is. Uh, going to be presenting uh, Death by Seawater, the short, tragic life and career of Tom O'Brien. And uh, <laughs> I was reading uh, that description again of his uh, his uh, abstract. It's a very intriguing story, and he'll, I'm sure he's going to tell it well. And that'll be our uh, May 14th presentation. On the following day, May 15th, is the deadline to submit, if any of you would like to do that out there, uh, to submit an abstract uh, for our season five, which will commence like in September uh, of uh, 2024 and run all the way through May of 2025, like an academic year. So uh, I hope uh, some of you will give that some consideration. And Bob, I want to... Uh, Congratulate you again on this program. It's been uh, really, really uh, great. And it's so great to see all of these uh, people that I'm going to see in about a week and a half <laughs> up in Cooperstown for our uh, Frederick Ivor Campbell 19th Century Baseball Conference. So, uh, again, thank you all for joining us tonight. And we hope to see you next month and uh, see some of you next week. And on behalf of Bob and uh, John Popovich and, uh, and myself, and Elena, thank you again. Just and what, just one one note on uh, uh, Thursday, April twenty fifth at eight p.m. on Zoom, uh, the book, the nineteenth century book club uh, uh, will meet again, uh, and this time they'll be going through inventing baseball, which was a project of this committee with essays from dozens of uh, uh, committee members, but covers a wide range of pre-professional pre-amateur almost uh, of baseball on through to the uh, turn of the century. Uh, and uh, uh, Peter Mancuso will be leading that discussion. So uh, if you've got yes. uh, some interest in that, please please come on April 25th at 8 p.m. via Zoom. A uh, um, uh, link will be sent out that morning. And the 100 greatest games of the 19th century. And I took a page from Matt Albertson's uh, idea of sending out questions in advance. So shortly later on this evening, uh, I'll be generating a group email that will have about eight questions on it pertaining to this book so that you don't have to, <laughs> you'll have some idea where we're going. I, I hope to only do as half as well as Matt did with it. <laughs> jo Joanne is holding up a copy of the, the, the hey, book there. Right. But if you don't have a, a hard copy, you uh, all Sabre members can, can download an ebook. Uh, uh, directly from the Saber website uh, for free. Thank you all very much. See you all next month. Have a good night. See you then. Thank you.